we should be called the children of God. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He loved us. Before I could love him, before I thought about loving him, before I knew him, he loved me that much. He loved you so much. The Apostle John was amazed by, by that in his writings. The love of God. You go out of the Gospels and you go to his first, second John writings, you, you see this, this theme about the love of God. He's amazed. You know, when we leave this building today, I, I hope you leave with some things that will help you in life. If you don't get anything else, get this. You were loved by God. You are loved by God. And he is your father. And what that means is as a heavenly father, he's going to take care of you. He's going to protect you. He's going to guide you. He's going to direct you. He's going to show you the way. He's not going to leave you as an orphan. But he's going to be with you. Jesus said that. He'd be with you always, even to the end of the age. Thank God that we have a heavenly father. He's a good, good father. It's just who he is. And aren't you grateful today for our heavenly father? Would you give him praise and thanks today? Amen. Amen. Glory be to God in the highest. Amen. I want you to remain standing with me as I read scripture. Then we'll pray and I'll have you to be seated. Taking the text today is from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Pastor Mike, the other guy, started last week a series for those of you that were here on being resilient. He shared with you that he wrote a book, right, called Resilient. It's going to be here next Sunday. I hope you'll pick up a copy. It's a great read. And it comes from a life lived, understanding that whole concept of being resilient. And this idea of being resilient, you know, we... We need this in our culture. We need this in our lives. We need this desperately. So let me read the text, and then um, we'll go from there. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. By the way, for those of you that are wondering, you know, you've got these huge screens up here. Why do we have this little TV here? And the reason that we have the TV is for the home viewers, the people that are online. They have texted us uh, different times and told us how much they enjoy this how much it, it makes it stand out, how much it means. So, so those of you on the camera, don't worry about getting me in the shot. Just make sure you get the TV. I, I'm you, meaningless here. Just it's this scripture. So just move it over so you get the whole TV. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. So let me read this passage, pray, and then you'll get to be seated here. 2 Corinthians 4, 7, and when I get to the highlighted portions in yellow, I want you to read them with me. Read those out loud, okay? You'll see it in the next verse, but here we go. But we have this treasure in clay jars. What's the clay jar? You, your, your body, your temple. This is the temple. Paul, in this passage, calls it a clay jar, and he says there's a treasure in there. Okay, it's inside of you. So that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. You remember that song? I'm trading my sorrows. I'm trading my shame. I'm laying it down for the joy of the Lord. I'm trading my sickness. I'm trading my pain. I'm laying it down for the joy of the Lord. I think I'll do a little more. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, amen. Come on, I like it. I'm trading my sorrow. Come on, sing. I'm trading my sorrow. I'm trading my shame.
promise will endure that his joy is going to be my strength though the sorrow may last for the night joy comes in the morning i'm trading my sorrows i'm trading my shame i'm it down i'm laying them down for the joy of the lord That's the kind of singing you do in jail that'll get the prison doors to fly on, wide open. Yeah. You know, we don't know what, what he sang that night with Silas, but I think it might have been just a little bit of yes, Lord, oh, yes. Lord, yes, yes, yes. Oh, yes, God. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, amen. Now, some of you that are going through some stuff, come on, sing it now. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Amen. Now, here's the deal. For people to be resilient, they've got to be singing, yes, Lord. You can't walk through life always in the negative. Just living negative, having a negative attitude, a negative outlook, negative talk coming out of your mouth. You got to be walking through life knowing that God has a yes for you. God has a change coming your way. God has a different. You know, some of you are going to experience it today. You don't know. You don't. You don't. You're not getting this yet. But some of you need to realize you're coming out of the season you've been in and getting ready to walk into a yes, Lord season. You're getting ready to walk into a yes time in the Lord. In the name of Jesus. I'm not saying that to hype you. I'm not saying that to do anything else except to give you the word of the Lord. I really believe that. Some of you are leaving behind the negative today and getting ready to walk into a yes season in Jesus' name. Amen? So you've got to realize that even though you're, that you're walking through being persecuted, struck down, all of that stuff, you're not destroyed. You're not forsaken. You're, you, you're not depleted. You, you, you may be knocked down, but you're not knocked out. You need to realize that, that, that the, the, the corner bell hasn't rung yet. You're still in this match. You're still in that. You may be down on the mat, but, but your coach in the corner hasn't said game over yet. It's not over. You're coming back. You're bouncing back off of the mat. You're getting ready to end this thing in the name of Jesus. Why? Because God is making you resilient. You haven't walked, hear me today. You haven't walked through the fire and through the flood to get to where you are today for the enemy to take you out. You've been through it. 
so you can defeat the enemy. You've been through it so you can be stronger now than ever before and you can walk victoriously in this season. If you believe that, give God praise today in this place. Now, come on, get the word inside of you because when you're having difficulty and you're being tempted and the enemy's coming at you, you better be equipped. When he's hitting you from every angle, you've got to be able to stand firm and say, this isn't over. Hey, you haven't gotten the best of me. This isn't over yet. Why is always... Listen. Listen. Yes. Yes. Hey, hey, you here, you here. I am here, I am here. You feel unloved. You feel unlovable. You feel unloving. I am the God of love. Come, give me your heart. Let me smooth it with love. I am here, I am here. You cannot be lonely when I'm with you. I'm here to love you. I'm here to teach you how to love. I'm here to teach you how to feel loved. No longer will you feel unloved because you have a father who loves you unconditionally, says the Lord. Come on, give the Lord praise and thanks today. Hallelujah. Oh, praise God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for that word. God, we receive it today. Thank you that we're loved by you. Thank you, Jesus. And for those of you that are wondering what's going on there, you may be new to church, new to the Lord or whatever, that's called prophecy, tongues and interpretation of tongues. Okay, so in your Bibles, we're in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and chapter 14. You'll read about it in the church. Okay, there's tongues and then there's the gift of interpretation of tongues. So that was a message that came out and then the prophetic interpretation. And that's the Holy Spirit moving on the prophetic ministry of this church, speaking the word of the Lord into our lives, okay? Isn't that powerful? Isn't that awesome? I love when God deposits his word in us. So what is going on in my life? What's happening? I want you to, I want you to couple the scripture with what you just heard the Holy Spirit speak to us as a body of believers. The first thing you need to realize, and I want you to go back to verse number nine again. I want you to understand that when you're persecuted and struck down, that doesn't mean you're not loved by God. Remember what the beginning of that prophetic word was? You're not unloved. You don't, don't think you're unloved. Don't think for a minute that I don't love you. You need to know and recognize that when you're walking through the wilderness and adversity hits and difficulty comes into your life, that has nothing to do with God not loving you. In fact, God may allow those things because he does love you. Because these things will be the making of you. So what is going on scripturally in my life when this is taking place? Look at verse 10. I'm caring about in my body the death of Jesus. When I'm being persecuted, struck down, when I'm having this adversity uh, uh, just seemingly attack my life, I'm carrying in, in my body the death of Jesus. I'm, I, Paul said, I want to know the fellowship of Christ's sufferings so that I can also understand the power of his resurrection. And that's exactly what Paul's teaching here. And the reason that's happening is so that, read it with me, the life of Jesus, right, may also be made visible in our bodies. So what's happening is this, 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 this tension, this, this attack, this thing I'm undergoing is working 
death in me so that life may emerge. Something in you has to die. If you want to walk in the power of the Holy Ghost, something has to die. And it usually doesn't happen on its own. It usually happens when this takes place. Watch this now, verse 11. For while we live, we are always being given up to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be made visible in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us but life in you. See, isn't this amazing? But just as we have the same spirit of faith that is in accordance with scripture, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and so we speak. See, it's really important that you watch your words when you're going through stuff. That you continue to speak life and not death. That you continue, hear me, that you continue, listen to this carefully, that you continue to speak outcome and not process. You understand the process. The process is necessary. You validate it. You don't invalidate it. You realize it's God's working, but you speak the outcome, meaning I'm coming out of this. God's working in me. God's doing something in me because God wants to do something through me. Are you understanding this today? Are you getting this today? Does this, does this make sense to you? It brings some, some clarity as to what on earth is going on in me. What on earth is happening to me? What on, why am I being squeezed? Why is this taking place in my life? That shows us. That reveals to us what's going on. So I want to speak to you today on what it takes to be resilient. What it takes to be resilient. And every person in this room, everybody watching, at some point in your life, you're going to experience getting punched, having the wind knocked out of you, having something come and sideswipe you out of the blue, having something happen to you in numerous capacities during this lifetime, you're going to have to master the concept of being resilient. What does resilient mean? Look it up in the dictionary. It means to rebound. It means to come back. Before you're seated, I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, you're coming back. Amen. And I want to prophesy to somebody today, your comeback is going to be greater than what you've been through. Your comeback is going to be greater. In Jesus' name, I believe it with all of my heart. God bless you. You may be seated. What does it take to be resilient? Number one, you've got to get this concept from our, from our text today, from this passage of Scripture. You've got to understand that what's happening in you has to be greater than what's happening to you. To be resilient, understand this principle, what's happening in you has to be greater than what's happening to you. I want to take verse 7 of our text, and I'm going to use different emphasis now in the yellow words. I'm emphasizing different words here. I want you to speak them out as we say these, this scripture. But we have this. What is the clay jar again? It's your body. It's your temple. And what Paul is saying is there's something really, really precious inside of you. He calls it a treasure. And that treasure is so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. In other words, you're not born inherently with this power. This power comes, if we look at the Bible, the Bible says that this power comes to you after the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you'll be witnesses. You have to receive Christ, receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit, and that's the treasure that's inside of you. And Paul wants every believer to know, it's not from you, it's from God. 
It belongs to God. He's deposited in you. As a matter of fact, Paul would write in, in other uh, texts in the New Testament, he calls the Holy Spirit a down payment in your life, a deposit. And it means just that. It's a down payment. What's it, now, whenever you make a down payment, you make a down payment on a house. You pay 20% of, the, of whatever the cost of the house is. Depending on what lending institution, some as low as 5%, some as much as 20%, and even higher. Or you make a down payment on a car, right? 5000 whatever the case is. The down payment is much smaller than the total amount, right? And what Paul's wanting you and me to understand is that you and I have a down payment in us called the Holy Spirit that's in our lives that is only an indication of something much greater to come when we pass from this life to the next. <laughs> you know, you think it's great now. Wait until you get up there. Wait until heaven is fully revealed to you. You're going to see and know things that are going to blow your mind. But right now, we can have a taste of that. See, you can walk around with a taste of heaven in your life all the time. You can walk around with this deposit in you. And Paul wants us to understand that we have this treasure that is in us, extraordinary power that comes from God. What's happening in you has to be greater than what's happening to you. You know, most of you know that I'm helping another church in Florida. I oversee that ministry there. There's a pastor that is leading the church there on the ground. Runs the day-to-day -day ministry. He's preaching there uh, today, and some of you will know him. His name is Kirk Carey, um, and, and he's, he's leading the work there. And so he runs the day-to-day, -day, and I come down there regularly. I travel back and forth, and I preach there. And this past week I was there. I just returned yesterday to come here. And while we were uh, there this past week, we had staff meeting. Well, Kirk has instituted what he had in Silver Spring, which is Camp Sunshine. This is the first year for them to have camp. This is the second week of camp. So uh, in the facility, there's a nice big kids area. It's really hot this past week in Florida, so we had the kids inside, and they're, make, they're bouncing around. They've got bounce houses that were donated, and they're making noise, and they're yelling, and they're uh, dancing. You know, they've got this dance choreograph thing that they're doing, and they're just having a blast in there. The, the, the unfortunate thing is that the meeting for the staff meeting is taking place in a room that's adjacent to this big space. So, you know, I don't know. I've led staff for decades now, different staffs, different places, this staff here, um, not so much anymore, but uh, dealing with staff people, you, you've, got, you've got people on staff that are ADD anyway, it's hard to keep them focused for a two-hour meeting, you know, it's really tough, let alone when you got noise outside. You know, so we're talking, going back and forth, and I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of watching people, and I know they're distracted because the noise is overwhelming. But kids are kids. We're not going to open up the door and yell at the kids and go, be quiet. Sit down. We're trying to have a staff meeting. They don't care. They're being kids. So you let the kids be kids. But after we talked and shared for probably about 30 minutes, just some things that were going on, then we went into prayer. And those of you that know Pastor Becky, or you've ever, been, <laughs> you've ever been in a service when the Holy Ghost hits her, or you've ever been in the room when she's praying, something's going to happen. You heard it over here. Say it again. Fire is coming in the room when the woman of God prays. She just, she's a prayer warrior. What can I say? I find her praying all the time. You, you've got a wonderful, wonderful lead woman here. And Pastor Becky, the woman just prays. So she's praying. We were praying in the room, and the Spirit of God fell. And the Spirit of God was moving in the room. Several of us, we were out of our seats, and we're just pacing on the floor, and we're crying out to God. And it, it got to a level 
where the noise that was inside our staff meeting room became greater than the noise of the kids that was in the adjacent room. Now all of a sudden, the noise on the inside became greater than the noise on the outside. Are you hearing what I'm saying today? Now you and I, we can't control a lot of times the noises that we hear around us. You can't shut those out. There are a lot of cultural noises. There are a lot of noises from people. There are a lot of noises from colleagues. There are a lot of noises is from well-meaning friends. Everybody's got a thought. Everybody's got an opinion. Everybody's got an objective. And sometimes they're way off. Be that as it may, you have to make sure that the noise that is inside of you is greater than the outside noise. You've got to raise and do whatever you have to do to raise the level. Because again, you're not always going to be able to control those noises. But you can, hear me, your volume can be greater than this. Pastor, how do you increase the volume? You read the word, and if necessary, you quote the word outside. Listen, there have been times when the enemy has attacked me personally. And how does he do that? Right up here. He tries to throw thoughts in here that shouldn't be in there. You know what I've done different times when I know it's really spiritual warfare? I'll just grab the word of God, and I'll start. I'll be by myself, but I'll start speaking it out loud. I start grabbing the word of God and I'm reading the word of God and I'm reading it out loud because I know that when Jesus faced temptation against the enemy, he used the word of God against the enemy. So I know that word of God is is my power, is my source. And so I start just reading the word of God and I raise the level of the noise that I'm making versus the noise that he's making. You hear what I'm saying? The other way to raise the level is raise the worship. Begin praising God. Begin lifting up praise to God. Begin exalting the name of the Lord. You can do just like we did today. I started reading the word of God, and then we broke. We didn't do it in the first service. We just broke into, I'm trading my sorrow. You know, you let the enemy know you're not going to just live with the condition you have and the way things are. You're not going to just live with the noise that he's making, but you're going to trade in your shame. You're going to trade in your pain. You're going to trade in all these things, and you're taking on the joy of the Lord. And you're saying, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. See, you got to raise the noise. However, you have to do that. You make sure that the noise inside of you is greater than the noise around you in the name of Jesus. Amen? The second thing you've got to realize if you're going to be resilient is disappointment is temporary. You know, one of the greatest phrases in the Bible is, this too shall pass. Or it came to pass. You know, it's kind of like a storm. It's kind of like a storm that comes uh, uh, in the weather to Baltimore. You know, it could be, could, by the way, isn't the weather wonderful this weekend? Yeah. Beautiful. Man, when I landed yesterday, I came out of 94 degrees with a heat, heat index of 112 down in Florida to 72 degrees. Man, I stepped out. I was like, wow, this is awesome. This is wonderful. But there are times in Baltimore you'll get a storm that come, comes. Thank God the storm doesn't stay. And some of us live and speak like if the storm is eternal. This is just my lot in life. I got to just live in the storm. No, it's going to pass. It's going to go away. It's your, it t- disappointment is temporary. The Bible says it this way in Psalm 30, verse 5. It says, for his anger is but for a moment. His favor is for a lifetime. Weeping May linger for the night, but comes with the morning. Joy comes with... What is, what is the psalmist saying? He's saying that disappointment's temporary. Weeping may only be for night. And you've got to realize that the biblical pattern is for your weeping to be temporary. You are not meant to carry sorrow day in, day out for a lifetime. That will crush you. It will suck the life out of you. You will be greatly disappointed and you will not be able to walk in spiritual or mental health. You've got to put on the garment of praise for a spirit of heaviness. You've got to make sure that you understand this verse that weeping will linger just for the night, but joy's coming in the morning. And by the way, let me just say to you right now, it's 1157. It's still the morning. 
And some of you need to realize you're coming out of your season of weeping and you're walking in a season of joy. You're coming out of your season of disappointment into your season of appointment and the glory and the anointing of God is going to rest on you in Jesus' name for this next season you're going into. If somebody receives that, say amen. Amen. Later on in this Psalm, verses 11 and 12, it says this, you have turned my, come on, say it with me, mourning into dancing. You've taken off my sackcloth and clothed me with joy. Verse 12, so that my soul may praise you and not be silent. Oh, Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. You see, this is another thing you need to do when you're being pressed and persecuted and tension and, and, and being attacked. You need to give thanks to God. Even while you're, like Paul said in the New Testament, in everything give thanks. What does that mean? That means that no matter what you're going through, always give thanks to God. Always give praise to God. You, you, you just wake up thankful. I do it every single day. I really do. When I wake up, I say, God, thank you that my eyes popped open today. Because some didn't make it through the night. Some closed their eyes last night and opened them overnight sometime in eternity somewhere. But thank you, God, that you opened my eyes. Thank you, God, that there's air in my lungs. Thank you, God, that blood is flowing freely through my veins. Thank you, God, that my heart is beating today. I thank you, God, for another day. Don't take it for granted, friends. Do Take today for granted. Give thanks to God and realize disappointment is temporary. And if you will give God thanks, it'll keep you from getting in a negative place in your life. The third thing that you have to do if you're going to be resilient is you got to get the rebound. You got to get the rebound. The other night, how many of you have been watching the NBA Finals? Celtics and Warriors. Do we have any basketball fans in here? Celtics, come on, lift your hands. To be proud. Be proud of it. You were. All right, all right. My boy Steph Curry just, he put it out there, man. Had a great series. Wiggins did great uh, later on in the series. He really pulled through, but I love the Warriors. I love Steph Curry. And Steph Curry, in case you don't know, he's a committed Christian, and he wears it. He just wears it. I saw one night on his sneakers, you know, on the side of his sneakers, he had Philippians 4.13 there. So if you don't know what that means you can, or what it is, you can look it up. Anybody in here played organized basketball in your life at all? Any basketball players in here? Huh? Come on, come on, raise your hand if you played organized ball. Anybody that can still shoot? (laughs) Huh? You can still shoot? Come here, man. I want you to come here. Come on, man. Yeah, you, come on down here. Tell everybody your name. Sydney. Sydney? All right, Sydney. Come on back here. Tell everybody your name. Huh? Yeah, that's his name. So Mabindo, I want you to stand here. Don't block it. Don't, I, don't want, I did this in the first service, and the, and the guy that I had standing here, he went to block the shot, you know? So just, just sit here. Sydney? All right. Yeah, I, I just want you to be over here for his shot. Let's see what happens with Sydney. He says he's played organized ball. Let's see if he has any game. That's, I just want to know if he's got game. That's all. Come on, Sydney. Okay. Okay, now he says long time. Yeah. Come on, let's give it up for Sydney. Uh-oh, he was feeling it. Did you see that? He was feeling it. Hey. One more, one more, come on. Come on, Sydney, one more. Come on, let's root for Sydney, come on. Okay, we still love you. Thank you, sir. 
Awesome. Now, I want, you to, I want you to understand something. Every single one of us, okay, every single one of us are taking shots every day. We've got goals in our lives. We have things we want to achieve. We have things in the Lord and in this life that we're trying to do. But you know what? We're going to miss shots. We're going to miss shots. Sydney missed a few. Okay, it's been a few years, right? But I, I, I saw by a couple of that. You, you can get your game back, though. I, I believe that. Did you, did you see after he made that one shot, he, he's, he's back. He, he just leaped and took that jump shot. He was on it, man. You and I are going to miss him. The, the point is, did you notice? Say that name one more time. Your first name? Mabindo. Mabindo. Okay. That's easy. I got it. Mabindo got the rebound, and without even thinking about it, he just passed the ball back to Sydney, give him another chance, give him another shot. Mabindo didn't get the rebound and then look at Sydney and go, You stink. You're horrible. You got no game. You need to find another sport to play. But you know what? Some of us, unfortunately, you're allowing people in your life who are not giving you the rebound. They're not giving you a second chance after you blow it. In your life, I've made mistakes in decisions that I've made about the church, about my family, about my personal life. But I thank God that God didn't throw me off of his team. I'm so grateful that I've had people around me who love me, who care for me, a church that loves me, and a church that will egg me on and say, come on, pastor, you can do it again. Listen, many, some of you don't know this, but I went through a real physical trial uh, years ago, back in, uh, when was it? It's been so long, I don't even remember. Where I had a virus that attacked my heart. It put me into intensive care. I, the enemy was talking to me day after day. You're done. It's over. I, I, my strength was taken from me. I was zapped with it. I, I had no strength left. And the enemy said, ministry's over for you. But I thank God. And I thought, you know, the, the church, they can't have me pastor them. I, 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 I can't do this. I had my wife had to take me around in a wheelchair at my house, inside my house, for months. This guy on the front row that you see here, who takes care of the house of God here with a team, he came over one time because I, I, I couldn't be at church. I, my, I had to sleep at least 10 hours a day. I was used to going four or five hours a night, man. I was just going nonstop. Now, all of a sudden, i got to sleep 10 hours just to feel like I have anything. I was out of the house of God for months. He came to my house with his guitar and led me in worship because I couldn't be in the house of God to worship. See, here's what I'm saying. Rather than him going, he's done, pastor's done, you know what he did? He got the rebound for me. He came to my house and said, Pastor, you're still in this game. It's not over. God's still with you. God still has a plan. And he came and just ministered to you. You have to get the wrong people off of your team, the people who are saying things to you that are negative, that are talking down to you, that are making you feel like you can't go on, and you need people who will get the rebound for you and pass the ball to you right after you miss the shot. Right after you missed it, you're back up in the game, taking the next shot. Come on, give God praise if you believe that today. And by the way, you not only need people in your life like that, you need to be that for somebody else as well. Because somebody else is going through a hard time. You know what my prayer was over here today, guys? I was praying, Lord, save somebody today. I don't mean eternal salvation. My prayer for them was... Save them from throwing in the towel. Save them from, from giving up. Save them from leaving their spouse. Save them from quitting. Save them from, from just saying, I'm done. 
And I pray today that God will give you that strength, that God will give you that power, that God will give you that vision so that you'll say, man, I'm going to keep going. I thank God for a rebound. I thank God for a second chance. Aren't you glad God's a God of a second chance? Come on, let's give these guys a big hand. Thanks, guys. That's teamwork right there. Just some trivia for you. You know who, um, uh, which NBA player got, had the most rebounds in a single game? Anybody want to hazard a guess? Yeah, he said what you just said, Paul. Wilt Chamberlain, that young man knows basketball. Yeah, he wasn't even alive when, when Wilt the Stilt was playing. <laughs> Wilt Chamberlain, I think it was 1967, had 55 rebounds in a single game. See, when you get rebounds, then you, you get another chance in life. God's a God of rebounds. The greatest player who ever played the game. Don't even talk to me about these other boys. This is the man that I watched him play, the greatest player of all time. I want you to see this clip real quick. I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game winning shot and missed. I've failed over and over and over again in my life. And that is why I succeed. Maybe it's my fault. Maybe I led you to believe it was easy when it wasn't. Maybe I made you think my highlights started at the free throw line and not in the gym. Maybe I made you think that every shot I took was a game winner. That my game was built on flash and not fire. Maybe it's my fault that you didn't see that failure gave me strength. That my pain was my motivation. Maybe I led you to believe that basketball was a God-given gift and not something I worked for. Every single day of my life. Maybe I destroyed the game. Or maybe you're just making excuses. If you're going to be resilient, you got to quit making excuses. No more. Let today be it. Over. I'm not making any more excuses for any failures in my life. But you let the failure motivate you. You let the disappointments cause you to go forward. And you realize today you, God has given you a rebound. How do I know that? Because you're alive today. He's given you a rebound. Take advantage of it. Okay? Take advantage of it. The next thing that you need to do if you're going to be resilient is you got to resist the virus and stay healthy. Here's what I mean. I resist the virus and stay healthy. The COVID-19 pandemic revealed to us the resilience of people, organizations, and churches. During COVID-19, during the pandemic, there were businesses that went out of business. They're no longer in business. Or they filed uh, for bankruptcy, and they've had to restructure and become resilient and get a rebound. You may know some of these companies. Some of them are still in business, but they're restructuring completely. Steinmart, Lord & Taylor, GNC, Brooks Brothers, 24-Hour Fitness, Advantage Rent-A-Car, Hertz, JCPenney, Neiman Marcus, Aldo, Gold's Gym, Pier 1 Imports. Some of those signs you won't see again. Others, you've still seen them. Because they're resilient, they're bouncing back, they're doing whatever they have to do to remain viable in the current climate. You and I have to resist the virus 
that wants to attack our lives, that wants to plague us, that wants to render us ineffective, that wants to attack our minds and say things to us that are lies from the pits of hell. You've got to stay healthy, healthy spiritually, healthy physically, healthy mentally, healthy relationally in every single way so that you can be resilient when the time comes. Because, listen, as I said in the very beginning, every one of us are going to go through a season in our lives that will test our resilience. Did you know that there are some churches that are not viable today? They close their doors because the pandemic took them out. No longer. We have reports in statistics that show that 30 to 35 percent of churchgoers no longer attend after the pandemic. They've evaporated. They've gone. They're somewhere out. They may be watching. They may be somewhere out in virtual universe somewhere, but they're not back in the house of God. I thank God for your faithfulness, church. I just want to commend you today as your pastor. I thank God for you. You helped in, during the pandemic to, for this ministry to stay viable and to stay online and to stay focused and to stay moving forward. And I give God all the praise and all the glory and all the honor, but I want to thank you for being people of integrity and people of God that have faith in him for resisting the forces of the world. You know, isn't it terrible that I have to say this today, but there are so many forces in our culture that are anti-Christian, that are coming against us, coming against our families, coming against our kids, coming against marriages, coming against all, just in every single way. But God is the strength of our heart and strength of our lives, and I believe you can stay healthy during a season like this. Can somebody say amen to that? Amen. The next thing you and I have to do if we're going to be resilient, we have to change the angle. Change the angle. I'll explain that in a second. The verse for it is Genesis 45, beginning of verse 3. This is the passage I want to read to you. This has to do with Joseph, the story. Many of you know the story of Joseph. Joseph was one of the youngest of, of Jacob's uh, kids. Uh, he had a younger brother, Benjamin, but other than that, Joseph was, was uh, the youngest, and he was favored by his dad, and his brothers despised him. And uh, so they're off uh, doing... Uh, uh, agriculture and farming and, 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 and uh, shepherding and so on and so forth. And they're way away uh, from Jacob's house. And Jacob gets concerned about him, so he sends Joseph to go see how his brothers are doing. They see him, Joseph, afar off, and they concoct this plan in their mind. They don't like him. He's, 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 he's an outsider in the family. And they're jealous of him. And so they decide what they're going to do is they're going to they're gonna pretend that an animal killed him and they end up selling him to a band of Ishmaelites that are coming and traveling southward to Egypt. And so they take their brother, they sell him to the Ishmaelites, and there he goes. And they go back to tell Jacob that he's dead. Your son is dead. And they have the coat of many colors. It's bloodied by an animal that they slaughtered and covered this, this coat that he had with blood. So Jacob knew it was, it was Joseph. And so Joseph gets sold in, into uh, to the Ishmaelites, then the Ishmaelites take him down and they sell him to Potiphar, uh, who's uh, one of the leaders of, of Egypt, um, and, and God blesses Joseph, but during that, he, he gets accused by his wife of seducing her. So he gets thrown into prison for several years. Pharaoh has a dream, nobody can interpret it, Joseph interprets it. And he says, hey, look, there are going to be seven years of, of plenty you got to store that up because there's going to be seven years of famine, and you want to take care of the plentiful years so that you'll have enough for the lean years. And so Pharaoh said, man, this, there's nobody smart as this guy. I'm going to raise him up to be the prime minister of Egypt. There's nobody going to be greater in power in this land than him except me. That's it, in the throne. But he's going to take care of everything else. So Joseph did that. Seven years of plenty, he stores up grain. Seven years of famine hit. It hits not only in Egypt, but it spreads throughout the then known world, all around. And Jacob, who's living in Canaan at the time with his family, they are experiencing this famine. So what Jacob does is he said, hey, there's grain in Egypt. Sons, I want you to go down to Egypt to buy grain. So the, so the, the, the sons do that. Okay, They don't know when they get it because it's been years. They don't know that when they see the prime minister that it's their brother. And Joseph toys with them a little bit. 
I love the story how he's just kind of playing with them. But then they come back on this visit, and Joseph can't take it anymore, and he's got to reveal himself to his brothers. And this is the story of it. So look what it says. Joseph said to his brothers, I'm Joseph. Is my father still alive? His brothers couldn't answer him, so dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I am your brother Joseph. He had to tell him a second time, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hear me, I want you to understand something. You have to realize, and I have to realize, that some of the things that happen to our, in our lives that, are, that, are, that may be terrible, they may be, they, they may be wrong. It was wrong what his brothers did. But you know what? Through all of that, Joseph was able to see the hand of God in it. You know how he was able to see the hand of God? He changed his angle. He changed his angle from being the oppressed brother, the sold brother, the despised brother, into realizing, hey, God had a purpose in all this. It was like he was living in the New Testament, Romans 8, 28. It's like he understood all things work together for good to those who love God and are called to according to his purpose. When it says all things, that uh, Paul didn't write just the positive things. (laughs) All things, that means the negative. God will cause it all to work for your benefit. But see, some of you, instead of having just a negative, rotten attitude about what's happened to you, you need to realize that God can turn it around and actually make it work for you. Okay? You just have to change the angle. Again, I'm going to uh, bring you back to sports analogies. You know, in football, they, they have so many different camera angles. There have been times when I've watched a game and I thought, that was the wrong call. The ref missed that call. And then they showed it from another angle And you see the call that was made was the right call. And some of us, we criticize things in life because that's our angle. But if we saw it from a different angle, we would look at it a little differently and have a different opinion about it. You know, today is Juneteenth. Juneteenth. And in this day, on Juneteenth, we recognize the emancipation of the African American from slavery in this country. And, you know, those of us that are not of African American descent, we may not understand that fully. But I, I, just, want to, I just want to encourage you. I've always tried to, to, to live a certain way, no matter what the situation is. If There are people, and I've traveled different parts of the world, ministered in different cultures, and always tried to look at things from that perspective. You know, it would do some of us who are not of African American descent a really, a really good thing to look at life from an African American perspective. So I'm speaking to my brothers and sisters who are not African American today and those of you watching online. Listen, there are a ton of good movies out there that show the experience of African American people. And African American people are some of the most resilient people on the planet. Because they've had to overcome adversity. They've had to overcome. I mean, I could go, the list goes on. Okay? But you think about where... African-American people have lived and what they've been through and where you, where you have come from. And you are a testament to the resiliency that God has placed in your life and in your culture. And so I celebrate you today. And I celebrate, I celebrate with you today. I've, there, there is a, uh, a book that I would encourage all of you to read. It's a leadership book. It's called Seven Habits of Highly 
uh, effective people. It's written by Stephen Covey. And there is a, uh, a principle in this book that I've taught my family. I've always, uh, they know this principle well. I've talked to them about it for years. And, it's, and one of the principles is this. It's seek first to understand, then to be understood. And if human beings all over the world would live by that credo, it would solve so many things. If you could just see life from a different angle, you'd get a different viewpoint. It may change your opinion, and it may change your outlook on things. And I just want to say this also, now that I've talked about that, from a spiritual perspective. You know, God wants you and I to have a different angle about life and about certain things that are going on in our lives. We need to look at it from a different view, a different lens. The Bible puts it this way. You know, you and I see things from an earthly perspective. But Paul wrote to the, to the Ephesians, he said to them, he said, you now are seated with Christ in heavenly places, far above principalities and powers. So when you see things from a heavenly perspective, it's a lot different than looking from an earthly perspective. When you see things from up far up high and you're looking down, it's totally different. In fact, let me give you just a little, little bit of homework. Our time is, is, is running out, and I want to be honoring to families and dads today for whatever plans you may have. So I'm going to kind of mo motor through this. I was going to read a little bit of it, of it to you, but read Psalm 73. It's a Psalm of David, and read the first 12 verses. That's all you have to read today. Here, let me give you the, the setting of it. David is perplexed. Because he's trying to live a good life, and, he's, and, he's, and he's, uh, he's persecuted, he's being done wrong, but he sees the wicked prospering. He's got a big question mark in his head. He goes, God, I'm trying to live. How is it that they're doing so well? How is it that their bodies are whole and fine, but we're sick and we're weak? I, I, I don't get this. And then he comes to this thought. He says, you know what? Me trying to live for you, God, living a clean and pure and holy life, it's in vain. Look at the outcome. But then something changes. He gets a different view and a different angle because of something he does. And I'm not going to tell you what it is. You have to read it. Psalm 73, verses 1 through 12. Read it today, and you're going to see his answer, the answer he gets, and how he gets it with the perplexity that he's facing. Real quick, and I'm going to close. Two things, real quick. If you're going to be resilient in this life, you've got to preserve faith and hope. You know, it's interesting. When, uh, when Jesus was talking to Peter, and he revealed something to Peter, he said, Peter... He said, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I've prayed for you. Does anybody know what Jesus prayed for? He says it in the next sentence. He says, I've prayed for you that your faith doesn't fail. You know, there are a lot of things that could fail. A lot of things. He could have said, uh, I've, I've prayed for you, Peter, that your prayer life stays intact. I prayed for you that you continue to worship. I pray for you that you'll just, you know, be the apostle that I know you can be. No, he said, I prayed for you that your faith doesn't fail. When you and I are attacked, when you and I are pressed, when you and I are, are, are having a, a, a time in life and we're going through it, the main thing, remember what Jesus said, Satan desires to have you to sift you as wheat. Satan wants to have his way with you. But if you have your faith, Peter, you're going to be okay. You and I, if we're going to be resilient, we have to preserve faith and hope. You know that scripture in the New Testament, right? 1 Corinthians 13, 12 and 13 says, For we see now only a reflection as in a mirror, but then we'll see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I've been fully known. And now, faith, hope, and love. Again, remain. These three, the greatest of these is love. Listen. There are people in this world who don't have love, but they bounce back. Why? They're motivated by something else. 
whatever it may be. And sometimes it's, it's not the right motivators. But you'll never get anywhere. Love is the greatest because it's the, it's, God is love. It's the greatest motivator. But you'll never get anywhere without faith and hope. You'll never be resilient without faith and hope. You've got to maintain that. And can I tell you, the devil wants to erode that. He wants to hammer that. He wants to steal that from you. Jeremiah 29, 11. For surely I know the plans I have for you. Turn to your neighbor and say, God has a plan for you. And here, what are those plans? Look at it. Here's what, God, here's what the Lord says. Plans for your welfare and not for harm to give you a future and a hope. Church, if you want to be resilient, you got to have faith and hope. Lastly, you need to create a different narrative. You know, the story that's been written over your life to this point doesn't have to be the story of your life moving forward. Create a different narrative. To illustrate this point, I want you to see this last clip, and then we're going to close in prayer. This guy was failing out of high school. He was struggling. He was raised by a single mom in the Midwest, but he promised his mother he would take a test called the SAT. Well, this guy takes it. He's, he's bombing. He's failing out of school. He doesn't expect anything. Well, he gets a 1480 out of 1600. So he's stunned, right? And his mother said, did you cheat? And he said, I swear to God, I tried to cheat, but the way the numbers were and the scantrons and the bubbles, you couldn't cheat. So what he decides is because he realizes he's smart and he's going into his senior year, he says, I'm going to go to class. He graduates, goes to a community college, and becomes this massively successful magazine entrepreneur. Twelve years after all this guy's success, he gets a letter in the mail. The year he took the test, he was one of 13 people sent the wrong SAT score. His actual score was a 740 out of 1600. And he said, people think my whole life changed when I got the 1480. But what happened? My whole life changed when I started acting like a 1480. And what does a 1480 do? He goes to class. What I do not how I feel about my past is going to determine who I am in the future. Stand with me, please, all over this congregation today. I don't know what your narrative has been up to this point. I don't know what your life story has been. Here's what I do know. You need to quit acting like a 740 and start acting like a 1480 because that's who you are. I don't care what it's been like. I don't care what your life what you've been through, what other people have said about you. Here's what I know. God's created you. You're alive today. You're in this house to hear this message. And I'm here to declare over your life, you are not a 740. You're a 1480 and above. And God has great plans for you to give you a future and a hope. You need to start acting like the 1480. The guy was a 740, but he believed he was a 1480. I love that story. You can be anything and do anything if you put your faith and your hope and your trust in God. Keep your eyes up. Keep your eyes looking forward. Don't be discouraged by the narrative that you've been living and you've been told and you've been squeezed into. God has a bigger role for you, a bigger plan. You're not here by accident on this planet. God has a role, a purpose for you to make a difference, for you to be different. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Father, I wanna thank you today for your presence here. I wanna thank you for your word. It's a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. I wanna thank you, God, for the 1480s that are in this congregation and watching online today. I thank you, God, that the narrative is not defining who they are, but God, how they act going forward, how they act from this day forward will determine, God, their future. So I pray, God, today, change their thoughts, change their minds, let them bounce back from disappointment, let them bounce back from the things that have hurt them, wounded them, from the things that have tried to knock them down and knock them out. God, may they find their resilience in you through the power of the Holy Spirit. And I thank you for what you're doing in us today. In Jesus' holy name, let everybody say amen. 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 Did this help anybody today? I hope it helped you. I hope it blessed you. Hey, dads. Dads, we love you. Make sure you go out and get your sliders and your A&W root beer. Get this little sticker for you, this pen uh, to take with you today. And I want you to raise your right hand to heaven. We close our services with declarations because there's death and life in the power of the tongue. Say this after me. Say, I am saved. I am healed. 
I am free. I have victory. I have authority. Change is here. I'm on God's side. And through him, I am resilient. In Jesus' holy name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week. We'll see you. Thank you for joining us at Life Source Church. We pray that today you found hope and freedom as you experienced the power and love of God. If you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, please let us know by clicking the link in the comments below. Again, thank you for joining us and have an incredible week.